So last week we looked at Bethlehem, this morning we're going to look at Egypt, next week we will look at Nazareth, and then the week after that, Capernaum. So if you've got a Bible, please open it up to the book of Matthew chapter 2, that's where we'll be this morning, Matthew chapter 2. We're going to look at uh, Jesus coming from Egypt and why that actually matters, and it's uh, pretty neat uh, what we see there. While you're turning there, I want to read just one verse Actually, from the Old Testament, I want to read a verse out of the book of Hosea, chapter 11, and uh, verse 1. I want to read this to you. It says, When Israel was a child, the Lord says, I loved him, and out of Egypt I called my son. So let's pray, and let's ask the Lord to bless our time together. Thank you, Lord, for being here. Being here with us, Lord, um, you are everything. You have everything. You have done everything. We just worship you, Lord. We humble ourselves before you. We look to you. We admit our need this morning. If you need the Lord to speak to you this morning, just ask him. He will. We thank you, Lord, for your faithfulness to us. We thank you that you will speak. It's in your holy and precious name we pray. Amen. Let me ask you a question. What is the craziest thing anybody has ever asked you to do? Just think about that for a minute. What's the craziest thing anybody's ever asked you to do? And then, did you do it or did you pass? Right? Like, has anybody ever asked you, let's say, to jump out of an airplane? Skydiving, right? Be kind of crazy. Maybe somebody has asked you to eat something that's like super weird. You ever had that happen? Uh, I have. (laughs) Maybe someone asked you to do something that is absolutely insanely crazy. They asked you to go shopping with them, Christmas shopping at Target on Miller Road, right? I mean, just crazy, right? Okay. Um, Right? Whatever that crazy thing is that somebody has asked you to do, then that's the question to you, though, is did you do it? Or did you pass? Like, nah, I'm good. No thanks. Now let me ask you a different question. What is the craziest thing that the Lord has ever asked you to do? (laughs) Some of you are smiling (laughs) because the Lord has asked you to do some crazy things. Has he ever asked you to do something? By the way, if you have ever repented of your sins and turned to the Lord... That was a crazy thing for you to do by human standards, but it was God telling you to do so, and you obeyed that. So you at least have that. But has the Lord ever asked you to do something? Um, and what is it? Maybe it, it, it's, maybe it seemed crazy to you. Maybe you've heard God say to you, maybe not audibly, but you just know God is speaking. People often ask me that. Chuck, how do you know God is speaking? And I say, I don't know, but I know when I know, you know? And they say, that doesn't help me. (laughs) I say, it's all I got. Listen, I know when he is speaking, I don't know, I just know that that it's him, and so that's how I know. And they they say, I still don't know, right? Uh, But like, you know, the Lord speaks to you and, and says, you know, just out of nowhere, you're just going about your business, and the Lord says, I want you to go, have you ever had this experience? I want you to go over to that person And I want you to tell that person that I love them, and I want you to tell them what I did for them. And you think, that's crazy. I I don't don't even know that person. They could punch me in the mouth, you know? I don't know what they would do. Like, what would happen? That seems crazy. Maybe the Lord says, you know what I want you to do? I want you to get up from your table. I want you to walk over and pay for that person's bill. I don't even want you to tell them. I just want you to pay for it. You think, Lord, that's crazy. I don't have a lot of money, Lord, and you're telling me to do this. It seems crazy, or maybe even it goes, it goes crazier. Maybe the Lord, like, like he did to me one time, said, leave your job and sell your home and go move, you know? And you go, Lord, this is nuts. What are we doing this for? Like, what, 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 have you thought this through, God? <laughs> Can I have these conversations with the Lord? But whatever that crazy thing is that God has asked you to do, maybe it was a, maybe it was a long time ago, I, I want to ask you, have you done it? Have you done a series of those things? 
I want to say this to you. Uh, it really is an adventure when you know you can trust the Lord, right? When you can trust the Lord, it really is an adventure because He can just tell you to do things and then you can do them knowing He's got you. It's okay. He's got you. This morning, we're going to see the Lord ask someone to do something that is crazy. And uh, for that, we look to Matthew chapter 2, beginning at verse 13. Before we jump in and read it, I want to give you a little bit of the backstory of what's happening as we come into this verse, okay? First of all, Jesus has already been born, okay? He is uh, now a child uh, under the age of two years old. We know that from the passage, but he is not a baby. He's not laying in the manger anymore. He's in a house. Uh, he is running around, maybe. He's walking, I don't know. Uh, but he's under two years old, okay? That's the idea. The wise men from the east have traveled, right, many, many months to come see Jesus, and uh, they, they find him, right? They, as they, you know, they follow this star, they come into Jerusalem, and they start to ask around, as we talked about last week, they ask around about where Jesus is. And then Herod finds out about that, and Herod calls the wise men in, and they say, yeah, you know, he's supposed to be born in Bethlehem. So then Herod calls the wise men and says, I know where the king is supposed to be born. He's supposed to be born in Bethlehem. So then he sends them. They go to Bethlehem. He tells them, though, when you go, if you find him, come back and let me know where he is so that I can come and worship him too. We know from the scriptures, he has no intention of worshiping Jesus. He wants to kill Jesus, right? We'll talk more about Herod in a few moments. But so uh, he tells them, this is where, you know, this new king is going to be. And so they leave and they make their way. And, and we know, right, the star moves and they move and they follow. It comes to rest right over the house of our Lord. And so they, they come to the house, they come into the house and they fall down before the, the Lord Jesus and they give gifts to him and they worship him. Very interesting. Verse 12 tells us, that while they are sleeping, now here's the thing, they got to stay probably in Jesus' house that night. That's kind of cool, right? That's pretty cool. Yeah, I mean, you know, we were like airbnb it at Jesus' house, you know? Like as shepherds, that's, as wise men, you know, from the east, that's a pretty cool thing to be able to go back and say, hey, the king of Israel, the Messiah, the Savior, the one who is God. Yeah, we were kicking it on his couch, you know? It's like pretty awesome. So they got to, right? But look what it says here, verse 12. They are warned, verse 12, then being divinely warned in a dream that they should not return to Herod, they departed for their own country another way. So the Lord comes to them and tells them that, that there is a danger, right? Tells them of, and you'll see in just a moment, tells them of, of, of Herod's intention, essentially, but just tells them, guys, you need to not go back to Herod, you need to go back home uh, uh, and, and so they decide to do that a different way. They take a different course. They take like, this is the normal road you would take. They take a totally off the beaten course sort of road so that they can't be followed. Okay, so they leave back uh, for, for, for home. And so that brings us to verse 13. Look what it says. Now, when they, the wise men, had departed, look what happens. Behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. So we're told here to pay close attention to what happens. That's what the word behold there means. It's like saying to the reader, hey, watch this, watch what happens now. And as we're watching, we see an angel comes and appears to Joseph, Mary's husband, as he is sleeping. And the reason for this angelic appearance, we're going to see in the next words, is to warn them. Look what the angel says. He speaks and says this, arise. Take the young child and his mother and flee to Egypt. Now, I don't know about you. I don't know how you like to be woken up. But uh, I don't like somebody coming and being like, wake up, right? I don't like that. I, I don't want anyone to shout my name. In fact, I hate my alarm clock, right? Even though it like slow builds now, it's like ding. Ding, 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 ding. Like by the fifth ding, I'm like, ah, right? Like throw that thing out the window. I hate this thing. Uh, I've told my wife, if you ever want to wake me up, um, all you have to do is whisper my name. What that tells me is there are many, many people in our house with guns, knives, and otherwise. If you say, Chuck, 
everybody's going to die. I know it because of the urgency of the whisper, right? If you said, Chuck, I'd be like, oh, it's totally fine. I could sleep through that. That's not a problem. But if you whisper my name, it means you don't want some evil person in our house to hear. And so I need to literally jump out of bed, which is what I do. Um, I don't like to be woken up like that, right? Um, I don't think any of us like to be woken up. Uh, All the moms in the room are like, yeah, welcome to our life, right? (laughs) I feel like um, we've been woken up every single night of our lives since our, really, since our our youngest daughter has been born. Uh, We've been woken up for eight years straight, and she's only seven, you know? So um, you figure that out. Okay, Uh, right, but here it is, right? The angel comes, and, and, and he comes to Joseph, and it's like, wake up, like, let's go. Like, it's time to get up. Now, the first thing I want you to notice here is that he comes to Joseph and not to Mary. This is important because I want you to see this. Um, He comes to the head of the home, the one who is called biblically to lead the family, the one who is called biblically to protect the family. He comes to the husband, the dad, right? Like, he comes to the man of the home. He does this, and, and what it says, right, is that Mary is just a woman, a godly woman, but she is just a woman. She is not divine, or the angel would have come to the one who was divine, right? She come, the angel comes to the husband, and, and, and it is his job to protect, it is his job to lead, and so the angel wakes him up and says, all right, Joseph, and, and fairly abruptly, I might add, right? I, I, don't, I wouldn't want to be woken up like this, but there is a sense of urgency in the whole passage. He says, get up. He says, there's no time to lose. And the way that it's written in the original language, it's like, get up now. So, this can't wait is the idea. What he's about to tell Joseph to do has to happen right now. Now, this is the middle of the night. I want you to understand. It's the middle of the night. Here's what he says. Take the young young child, the young children, (laughs) take the young child and his mother Uh, Side note, Mary is always called Jesus' mother, but even though Joseph is a very godly man, he is never called Jesus' father. That's because he is not Jesus' father. God the Father is Jesus' father. Joseph was Mary's husband, a good and godly man, but not Jesus' father. So, it says, take the young child and his mother and do what? Flee to Egypt. The word flee here, it does not mean, uh, you know, get up. Whenever it makes sense to get up, make a cup of coffee, pack a few things, you know, go you know, read the paper, <laughs> jump into the car, and just make your leisurely trip to Egypt, right? That's not the words here. The words mean escape, run, it's time to go, is the idea. Hurry up, get going, no time to waste. Now, two questions would immediately come to my mind if someone woke me up in the middle of the night like this, right? Number one, why? <laughs> I'm sorry, <laughs> why are we doing this? <laughs> why do I have to jump out of bed? What, what is happening? And then the second question is, how long? Like, you're telling us to go to Egypt. How long are we going to be there? Is this an overnight thing? Is this like a weekend? Are we planning like a, is, is it a week long? Like, how long are we supposed to be there, right? I, so these are the two questions in my mind. Well, the angel actually answers those two questions with the rest of the verse. Verse 13. The angel tells them why. First of all, look what it says. For Herod will seek the child, the young child, to destroy him. It's literally Herod is looking and he won't stop. He's searching and he wants to destroy Jesus and he's not going to stop looking. So you can't just move within a suburb of Jerusalem. You've got to get out of here. You've got to get into somewhere that he does not have power, which was Egypt. So... Uh, that's the why. Now, uh, I want to I encourage you guys, those of you that are trying to lead your family, I want to encourage you with this. This is a command to protect the family. I want to encourage you guys with something, and it's this. The Lord still does this. He still leads. He will still direct. He will still lead you. He will lead you in protecting your family. He will lead you in leading your family. He will, he will still do what we see him doing right here. I remember uh, several years ago when my wife and I were first married, 
we were in our first house, and uh, we were having some problem with uh, an air conditioner um, that had gone out in the middle of summer. And so uh, we looked in the phone book and uh, found a, a repair person. We just didn't know anybody that did that sort of thing. And so we looked in the repair, you know, in the phone book and, and called the repair people out. They came out, and two guys came out in an unmarked van, basically. And um, I was out there with them, and they started to uh, ask questions that at first seemed normal and then got stranger and stranger as they kept asking. Um, for instance, right, it went from... Uh, you know, questions about, you know, how's it going, how are things, et cetera, et cetera, to what time do you leave for work? That's a weird question for a person working on your air conditioner to ask. Uh, then, you know, what time do you get home? Uh, they somehow, without even knowing where I worked, knew how long it took me to get home. It takes you about 40 minutes, huh, to get home from work? I never told them where I worked. And yes, it did take me 40 minutes to get home. Then they asked, didn't ask, they said, your wife doesn't work, does she? Stays home? Yeah, that was like, ding, 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 right? Bells, alarms are all going off. Yeah, so I clammed right up, you can imagine, right? Excused myself, uh, told those guys, you know, they gave me their quote or whatever. They were asking, you know, you know, all kinds of weird questions and stuff. Took their quote, said, thanks a lot, I'll give them a call. And I'm not kidding you, came into the house, my wife can attest to this, I heard from the Lord immediately, not audibly, it wasn't like some thundering voice from heaven, but it was like, when you know, you know, you know, right? And I knew, time to go. The Lord said, it's time to go. And so we did, we packed up our stuff, and uh, we were gone a few hours later, and we never went back to that house, legit, put the house up for sale, and sold it. Uh, and I am 100% convinced to this day that, that it was for the protection of us, but specifically of my wife. Um, and so, listen, we've, we've got to listen to the voice of the Lord. Now, you've got to be careful because there's also an enemy who tries, to, who tries to get you to do stupid stuff that is in rebellion to the Lord, right? But you've you got to realize, like, the Lord will... Lead And this is the Lord's leading. It is his protection here. And, and we know what Herod was plotting because we're told, but they didn't know that. They didn't have Matthew chapter 2 to read. You know what, I think, uh, I, think I read something about that somewhere. Oh yeah, there, there we are, and uh, this is what's happening, right? They didn't have that. And so they didn't know until God told them. It's just like you. You don't know until God tells you. And how could the Lord do this? Well, it might seem obvious, but we know the Lord knows. He knows everything. He knows all things. He sees everything. He understands everything. How could the Lord have known what was going on in Herod's heart? Nobody else knew, but God knew what was going on in Herod's heart, what was passing through his ears, right? Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 10 says this about the Lord. I, the Lord, search the heart. I test the mind. Oh, 1 Chronicles chapter 28, verse 9, the Lord says this. He searches all hearts and understands the, all the intent of the thoughts. That means God is searching every single person's head and heart all at the same time. Incredible. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 13. All things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. He sees everything. And so the Lord knew what Herod was thinking before Herod knew what Herod was thinking. Right? The psalmist David was amazed that God, there was, before there was even a word on his tongue, before he even knew to say something, before the, the thought had even formed, God knew it already. It's incredible. Now, let's pause for just a moment. I want you to try to put yourself in Joseph or Mary's sandals for a moment. Okay? Just try to put yourself there. I want you to just try to imagine that tonight, okay, tonight, an angel of the Lord appears to you at 1.30 in the morning, comes and, and, and shakes you, wakes you up and says, hey, listen, you got to go right now. You have to go right now. Not Tomorrow, not a week from now, you got to go right now. You got to get your stuff. You got to go right this second. I want you to try and put yourself there. 
You gotta quickly get your family up. You gotta quickly get your things. You gotta quickly get out of here. And in the middle of the night, you need to travel either on foot, which is what they would have had to do, either on foot or by donkey or camel to like Kentucky. <laughs> right? I just want you to picture this. This is what they're being told to do. And not only that, but then I want you to stay there until that same angel comes back to you to tell you it's okay to come back home. I want you to stay there. What would you do with this? What would you do? Tonight, an angel comes, 1.30 in the morning, telling you, let's go, you got to get out of here. What would you do? What kind of obedience does it take for, for, for us to do what Joseph had to do right here? Would you do this? Listen, I think it's entirely possible that it would have been so easy for Joseph to just totally written this off. Like, man, whew, that, was a, that was a weird dream. That shawarma I ate last night probably was bad, you know? I've been thinking some weird thoughts today, you know, just a strange dream, you know? I can imagine it would have been tempting, really, for Joseph to just gone back to bed and to have written that off as nothing, to dismiss it. But he doesn't do that. He doesn't do that. Look what it says in verse 14. When he arose, and that's the question, when did he arise? Did he stay in bed a little longer? Did he contemplate things? Well, the rest of the verse makes it clear. Verse 14, when he arose, he took the young child and his mother, what does it say? By night and departed for Egypt. He got up and left with his family. Isn't this incredible? I mean, just think about it for a second. This is crazy. I mean, Joseph, what about the house? What are you going to do with the house? How are you going to figure that out? Joseph, what about the family and the friends that you're leaving behind? What about the job that you've been a part of? Like, what about your 401k? What about, like, what about all these things? You're just going to be like, see ya, off to Egypt. That's exactly what he did. He went right away. And I wonder how many of us would do the same thing. And I don't mean that about you. I, I mean that about me. Would I be willing to do this same thing? W with the urgency, with the immediate obedience that we see in Joseph, would I be willing to do this? I think sometimes we think, Man, the Lord never tells me anything to do. But then we've got to kind of ask ourselves, but would we do it if he told us? Right? And so sometimes we go, well, I mean, if the Lord came and said that, I mean, I'd have to, I'd have to lift, list my house first, and I'd have to, have to figure out some things, and you know, i got to put some, you know, three months from now, maybe I can make that work. You know, I mean, we would want it to make sense. We would want it to be smart. We would want it to be these things, and yet Joseph had no time to do that. Listen, I'm not talking about being reckless. I'm talking about following the Lord. Can, can I say this to you? God sees everything, and so his leading is always right. Let's just put this on the table. We don't know. We don't know. We don't know what's best. We think we do, but we don't. We don't know what tomorrow is. We don't know what the next day is. We don't know what the next year is, right? Can you tell me what 2021 is going to be? Because I'm going to need a solid commitment here that it's going to be awesome, <laughs> all right? Like, we don't know. We as people don't have this ability, but God does, and he sees everything. So God says to you, I want you to go over and pay for that person's meal, and you're like, Lord, I don't know how I'm going to make my rent check today. How, how are you telling me to go pay for this meal? By the way, the Lord told me to do that one time. I'm probably going to ruin all reward in heaven by telling you this, but the Lord told me to do that one time. I thought I was going to be paying about $15, and so I went over and I said, hey, let me, I'm gonna, I, told my, I told the waitress, I said, listen, I want to pick up this, this, this table right here. I want to pick up their meal. I figured $15, $30, somewhere in that range. She comes back. She goes, okay. She sets, um, she sets three receipts in front of me. And I said, oh, I said, oh, well, what are all these? You know, am I, am I paying for the whole restaurant? Is that what's happening? You know? And she goes, oh, yeah, they've got, they've got two carryout orders. I was like, oh, do they now? 
She's like, so did you just want to just want to take care of all of it, or do you want to just take care of theirs? And I was like, Lord, <laughs> what? I was, I was like, you know, let me let me can can I have a second? I just need. <laughs> and she was like, oh yeah yeah you know. And the Lord's like, you take care of all. Of it. I was like, okay, I guess we're taking care of all of it. You know. So she comes back. I said, yeah, we're taking care of all of it. And uh, she's like, oh, that's so, and I said, listen, no, it's, and talk to her, you know, it's, it's the Lord, you know, the Lord is the one he wants to, and so got to share with her. Then they went over, I said, please don't tell them, we're going to leave now, you know, so we leave. Well, the one, another waiter figure, finds out or something, he goes over, he tells them, and then he comes running out, and he wants to talk, and so then I, we get to talk to him about the Lord for a minute, and then we see them through the window like, man, we made out, you know, like, good day to be taking home carry out, you know, it's like. Ah, geez. Right? But you go, you know, the Lord tells you to do something and you think, oh, okay, okay, I can maybe, maybe do that. Or, Lord, don't you know I got the rent coming up? Like, how am I going to pay for this? And the Lord goes, listen, you don't see like I see. You don't know what's going to happen. Do what I'm telling you to do. This isn't about money, you guys. I'm not, that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying anything, the obedience of the Lord. Lord, I can't, just, I can't just quit that job and go do this thing. I can't do that. The Lord goes, listen, if you saw what I saw, you would understand why I'm saying what I'm saying. We so often think we know what's best, and man, we don't. There is only one who is wise. Obey him. Follow him. Do what he says to do. It's always what is best. And so... Uh, Joseph does not stay in bed a little bit longer. Uh, he immediately gets up. Verse 14 says, when he arose, he took the child and his mother by night and departed for Egypt. He did it right away. And then how long did he stay in Egypt? Which is exactly the same as asking how long was he obedient. There, there, there's two commands here. Go and stay. <laughs> Do both, right? That, that, that's what's being told here. How long did Joseph obey the Lord? Well, we're told in verse 15, and was there until the death of Herod. How long was this? Well, some say a few months. Uh, others say it is actually closer to three to four years. Certainly possible. Either way, can you imagine? Uh, you are staying in another land. I, I just want you to think about this, right? Where are you living? How are you supporting yourself? What community do you have? What, 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 I mean, what are the difficulties of just, you know, pulling up into Egypt with a donkey, right? Like, that's it, right? What are the difficulties? And yet, this is what they have done. And then they were there for the entire duration. Um, Joseph is a godly example to us of how to uh, hear the Lord and obey Him. Listen, I've seen a lot of people say that they, they've heard something from the Lord to go do something, and so they go do it. And then they don't stick with it. They, they, don't, they don't finish what God told them to, to finish. They don't stay where God told them to stay. They, they, just, they get bored, or they get annoyed, or they get whatever, and then they just peace out. They just, just leave out of that situation. No, no, listen, it's important to do what the Lord wants you to do, but then also to complete, to finish, to stay where the Lord wants you to stay. And can I encourage you to do that? Don't, don't, don't leave where the Lord tells you to stay. And don't go. If he says, he says, stay there, don't go anywhere. And also, don't stay if he says, go. Don't do that. He knows, and he sees, and he understands all things, and what he says is always best. Now, understand something. This command to go to Egypt, it was not random. Like we saw with Bethlehem, this is also another fulfillment of prophecy, biblical prophecy, okay? Uh, that's what the rest of verse 15 says. Look what it says. That it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet, saying, out of Egypt I called my son. Um, <laughs> the word prophet there, it refers to Hosea, what we read at the very beginning, Hosea chapter 11, verse 1. Now, notice carefully the words that are used because it tells us what a prophet really is. This is what a prophet is. That which was fulfilled, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Okay? So as we said last week, prophets, biblical prophets, are not super people. They don't have the ability to, to tell the future, to see the future. They are just mouthpieces for God. God speaks through them. And so, yes, they talk about future things, 
but God just speaks through them. They write about future things because God is outside of time. God sees all of humanity all at once, okay? All at one time. Listen, my, my systematic theology professor in Bible college held up a string. He said, this is all of human history. The creation of everything, the end of everything. God looks at all of it, all at the same time. Here's where his son was born. <laughs> Here's where you were born. If you couldn't tell the discernible difference there, that's because there's a lot of time, right? The creation, like, like God sees it all. It's on a string in front of him. He sees it all. He, he looks at the end. He looks all the way at the beginning. He looks into the middle, right? God sees all of this all at the same time. It's incredible. And so Hosea, here Hosea is. He's writing hundreds of years before Jesus came. But that's because the Lord looked forward, looked at, looked at Herod, saw what Herod was thinking. Herod's going to chase my son. I'm going to send my son into Egypt. So now I'm going to go back to Hosea, and I'm going to say to Hosea, Hosea, write these words. Out of Egypt have I called my son. Right? Just, just astonishing, right? Hosea had no idea what he was writing about. He probably thought he was writing about when the children of Israel left Egypt in the Exodus. Right? Out of Egypt I have called my son. Right? Yeah, okay, great. Yeah, it sounded good. He had no idea he was writing about the coming of Jesus Christ. But this is where we get into the phenomenon in biblical prophecy called dual fulfillment. What that means is, is that a, a, a one prophecy can have two or more, actually, fulfillments. What that means is, is it, can, it can refer to two future events. Right, One prophecy can refer to two future events and be perfectly fulfilled in that. Or it can refer to a past event like we have in this situation. It's explaining the past event, but then is prophesying about the future event. It's amazing. This is where we see the omniscience, the all-knowing nature of God. He alone can orchestrate all of this. I couldn't orchestrate one of these. God can lay down one prophecy that talks about the past perfectly and yet fulfills thousands of years into the future perfectly? I mean, this is astonishing. It's a reason the angels are just in awe of God. That's why the Bible says that prophecy is God's thing. It's His thing, nobody else's. It belongs to Him. Isaiah 46, verse 9, here's what the Lord says. Remember the former things of old, the Lord says, for I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is none like me. And then He says, and I'm going to prove it to you, verse 10, He says, declaring the end from the beginning, and from ancient times, things that are not done yet. God says, there's nobody like me. I hold all of human history right here in a string. I know it all. I see it all. Nobody else does. It's God's thing. <laughs> Isaiah 41, verse 22, the Lord, he's talking to the other gods, right, that Israel was worshiping, and he tells them, to prove themselves. Here's what he says. I love when God, by the way, maybe I shouldn't, but I love when God mocks other gods. It's like the best. It's so funny. Because God's like, you're listening to them, but they don't even have mouths. They have no arms. They can't do anything. They fall over and need somebody to pick them up and help them. Are you kidding me? God's like, right? You think there's no humor in the Bible. There's humor. All right. So, Isaiah 41, verse 22, the Lord is telling the other gods to prove themselves. He says, let them bring forth. Oh, you're real? Okay, let them bring forth and show us what will happen. Let them show the former things, what they were, that we may consider them, and then know the latter end of those things. See, dual fulfillment. He says, or declare to us the things that are to come. He goes on, verse 23, show the things that are to come hereafter, that we may know that you are gods. And then in verse 24, you know, he's super delicate, super gentle. He says they can't do this because they're nothing. <laughs> I love it. This is awesome. Isaiah 44, the Lord invites anybody who would challenge him to do so and says, who can proclaim as I do? He's talking about prophecy. Let him declare it and set it in order in front of me. I want you to just, go ahead, tell me what's coming and then set it in order in front of me so I can see it. Prove who you are. I love it. I, Acts chapter 15 Verse 18 declares, known to God from eternity are all his works. 
Literally, he has a perfect knowledge of all of eternity, all at the same time. It's incredible. So he holds all of eternity as we would hold a string. He sees all of it at one time. And so Hosea can write hundreds of years before Jesus comes with perfect accuracy about the coming of Jesus Christ. And so what we read here in our story is just an incredible display of the the seeing ability of God, right? He saw, think about it, he saw Herod. He heard the things that Herod was contemplating in his head. He knew what Herod was doing in his heart. Nobody else knew what was going on. God saw it all and then went right to Hosea and said, write these words. It's incredible. Incredible. So, uh, Romans 11.33 is a beautiful verse describing this. Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. Amen. Now, for the conclusion of the story, it gets pretty gruesome here. Verse 16 Then Herod, when he saw that he was deceived by the wise men, so they did not come back to him, he he recognized he had been tricked by them, he was exceedingly angry, and he is a very angry man. I'll show you that in a moment. And he sent forth and put to death all, listen, all the male children who were in Bethlehem and in all its districts from two years old and under, according to the time which he had determined from the wise men. We go... What? This guy is so evil, he gives a command to slaughter every baby boy under two years old. And sometimes we read things, we become familiar with them. You got to stop for a second. I want you to see this. Every soldier, Roman soldier, is tasked with the responsibility of going door to door as everyone's trying to hide their children, and now they're grabbing these children and they are slaughtering them in the streets. And if you're appalled by that, you should be, of course. Like, that is what it should do in us. And yet, somehow our world, though they are doing this every day, does not see it in the same way because it's within the womb rather than outside of it. And yet the wholesale slaughter of human beings is happening every single day of our lives. But we call it something else. Because if we deliver the baby and then we slaughter it, well, then it's murder. We're messed up. Stuff's upside down. The Bible says we're getting to a place where we're calling everything good evil and everything evil good. And we're really upside down on some things. And it ain't making anybody better. It's bringing a whole lot of judgment down on people's heads. And this is here, here, you see it, right? Herod doing this. She saw it all the way back in Egypt, the same command. Slaughter of the innocents back in Egypt. You think, man, Herod, what a, what a vile human being. Absolutely, he's a vile human being. In fact, let me just tell you a little bit of, of his history he slaughtered, uh, one, one man writes on a, a biography of him, he slaughtered the last remnants of the Has- Hasmonean dynasty of Jewish high priestly kings who had ruled before him. He just walked in and s- he just slaughtered them all. He executed more than half of the Sanhedrin. He killed 300 court officers without cause. He just, he just killed them just to make a point. Uh, he executed his own wife. Thought his wife was conspiring against him, so he executed her. And then he thought that uh, her mother was in on it, so he executed her. Then he thought his three sons were in on it, so he executed them with his own hand, by the way. Get this, finally, as he is dying, as he's laying there dying, he arranged for all the notable men in Jerusalem to be assembled in the Hippodrome and killed as soon as his own death was announced. So, They literally went through and they grabbed all the men, the able-bodied, the the capable men, and they they brought them all into this arena, and then soldiers surrounded them, and then uh, they were waiting for the command that Herod had died, and as soon as Herod had died, their job was to strike every person down and kill them. That is what he put in place. Thankfully, they didn't do it. They were like, well, he's dead, so I guess we'll pass on that, you know? But it goes on and says he's a man of ruthless cruelty and with a fanatical neurosis about any competition, 
it is quite in character that he should order the execution of the male children in Bethlehem. It's quite in character. But listen, though Herod, like many of the world's leaders have often thought, Herod thought he was untouchable, but death came to his golden door. Look at the next words there, verse 19, now when Herod was dead. All human power comes to an end. It does. And then they stand before the true and only power. Every leader, every ruler, but every person needs to hear this. The Bible says it has been appointed for men to die one time, and then comes judgment. We stand before God. Regardless of what Herod thought, whatever his religions that he was a part of, whatever he thought in his mind, he found out what was true when he took his last breath and stood before the only true king and the only true God. And this is something that every politician, every ruler, every king, every president, every dictator on planet earth needs to hear. Your life, it's what every person needs to hear, your life is counting down. You are dying now. Everybody's so freaked out about dying. You're dying right now. Your life is counting down. It's coming to an end. The day of your death, you are running out of time. Herod was not strong enough to escape death, and neither are you. There's not enough money in this world that stops a man from dying. I remember looking at the emaciated body of Steve Jobs Stage four cancer, knowing he had spent God only knows how much money trying to stave off death, and yet the day of his of his death came, and he stood before God with all of his wacky ideas, brilliant man, genius man, creative man, stood before God and was asked, Why did you deny the only way that I provided? It's coming. No one will escape judgment. No one will escape it. Listen, every person will die. No one escapes death, but you can escape judgment. And you can escape judgment by the one that Herod was hunting. You can escape judgment by that child who grew up and pinned himself to a cross for your sin and for mine. You can escape the judgment of God by allowing your sin to be paid for, but you must confess, you must repent, you must come to God, and God will never force you. It must be your decision. One last point to make clear this morning. Jesus being in Egypt fulfilled something else. For those of you, prophecy, uh, you're interested in prophecy, you're interested in theology, that sort of thing, Listen, uh, Deuteronomy 18, Moses made a promise. If you remember this, he prophesied and he said that one was coming who was greater than he was. And listen, in the Jewish mind, there's nobody greater than Moses. But, but Moses said, hey, one's coming after me who is greater than me, and him you must listen to. Listen to everything he says. He was talking about the coming one, the Messiah, the King, the Savior. Moses said this one is coming in Deuteronomy 18. But listen, it's in this way that Jesus being in Egypt tells us something that is important. You see, him coming out of Egypt tells us that he is the one that Moses was promising. You say, how so? Well, the two, it might be hard to miss this, or might, might be easy to miss this, I don't know. The two are set side by side. I, I want you to see this for just a second. Moses, where was he born? Israel. Jesus, where was he born? Israel. A command came during Moses' childhood, right? Early, early childhood. For what? The slaughter of the children, the Hebrew children. A command comes in the early childhood of Jesus, and it is the same command. In fact, we don't really see that command throughout the scriptures like this, until we come to Jesus in Matthew chapter 2. But a command is given from Herod now, the slaughter of the firstborn children under the age of two years old. Where was, where was Moses hidden? In Egypt, right? And, and you could keep going, by the way. Moses was placed into a basket and floated down this river. Jesus 
was placed into a tomb, right? I mean, just like, you could keep going, but, but here it is, right? Jesus is hidden in Egypt. Moses is hidden in Egypt. Jesus is, is, comes out of Egypt. Both of them come out of Egypt as the deliverer. Moses comes out as the deliverer of Israel, and he comes out with the law. Jesus comes out of Egypt as the deliverer of all people. And with grace, mercy, salvation. Moses kept them safe from physical death, from the death angel who passed through by the blood of a lamb. (laughs) Jesus keeps us safe from the ultimate death by the blood of himself, the lamb. Just goes on and on, right? That's the whole point. Hebrews chapter 3, the whole point of Hebrews chapter 3 is to tell us that Jesus is the one who is greater than Moses. This is the one who was promised. He is the deliverer. Listen to this, Hebrews chapter 3, verse 3, talking about Jesus. It says, for this one, Jesus, has been counted worthy of more glory than Moses, inasmuch as he who built the house has more honor than the house. The idea here is Jesus is the one who gets all the glory. You don't walk into someone's house and go, my goodness, this house is beautiful. House, you have done a fantastic job on yourself. Like your design choices are on point. Walk over to the window. Nice choice window. This is great. I see you went with the uh, whatever option. <laughs> I don't. There's the limit of my construction knowledge. We don't do that. We walked into the house. We go, my gosh, this is incredible. This is beautiful. And whoever decorated it, man, that's. Oh, it, did you build this? This is unreal. This is amazing. You decorated this, right? The house doesn't get the honor. The, the, the builder gets the honor, right? That, that's the point here. And, and listen, can I, can I just say this to you? It's an important point to emphasize. People should never be exalted. Celebrities, an abomination to God. I don't mean that in a flippant way. I mean that that no person should ever be exalted, ever. Nobody. No celebrity should exist. We live in a celebrity culture where we exalt people. That's because we don't know who to worship. We're built to do it, but we don't know who to do it to. So we worship people, and it's bad for them, and it's bad for us. Look at any modern celebrity and go, oh, that's going well for them. It does not go well for them. Oh, let's shower all the money we can on them. Let's make it so they don't ever have to tell themselves no about anything ever in life. Let's see how that goes. And then let's tell them that they are the greatest thing in the whole world. And let's fall all over ourselves when we're around them. No, no, no. (laughs) No celebrities. And listen, can I especially say this? No celebrities in the church ever. We're the ones who are not supposed to be confused by this. We know who to worship, and it is definitely not the guy standing up here or the guy standing over there or this person doing that thing. Never, right? People are never to be exalted ever, 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 ever. It's bad for you. It's bad for them. Don't do it. We don't need another celebrity pastor to fall on his face to prove this. It is not good. Don't put people up. Don't put people up. We are all The ground is level at the foot of the cross. We're all in the same place. We're all in need of him. Nobody's better than anybody else. Nobody's more holy. Nobody's closer to God. Nobody's better. Nobody's got it like more figured out than anybody else. Like we are all in desperate need. We don't exalt people ever. It's bad news. So, (laughs) don't exalt Moses here, right? That's what he says. He says, the one who builds a house is worthy of the honor, not not the house itself. So, as we close this morning, doesn't this story speak to the protection of God? Don't, Don't tune out here. I want you to hear this, okay, very carefully. God really sees. He really knows. I mean, like, He knows what 2021 is going to be. He knows. He sees. He knows exactly what is going to happen with you. He knows this. And listen, he protected them from a threat they didn't even know existed. They had no idea until God showed it to them. 
You have no idea. I have no idea. Can we just put that on the table this morning? Can we just say that? We don't know. We think we know what's best for us, but we do not. We should trust the one who sees it all. We should trust. That's why the Bible says he alone is wise, because he can look and say, that's the right decision, that's not the right decision, that's the thing you should do, that's not the thing you should do. It seems like it's not wisdom for us to do this when God says it is because of the way he's going to do this and this and this and this, and we just go, our mind is blown, it's like smoking, I can't even hardly think of these things. Yeah, I know, just trust the Lord. Know him, love him, follow him. We so often, man, we think we know. Especially us as guys, man, I, I know, I, I got this, we can do this. You don't know. The way you lead is to follow. It is. The way you find where you're supposed to be is you just stay so close to him and you just keep asking, what do you want? What do you want? Where, where do you want me to go? What do you want me to do? What, what, what do you want me to... What, what do you want, God? What do you want? You see all. You know what's best. You know what. You know. I don't know. You know he protects you? And that's been tested this year, hasn't it? Your knowledge of whether he protects you or not has been tested, hasn't it? Anybody? Listen, I, I stand here with my hand up. I want to protect my family. You realize, I can't do that. Well, I'm not going to be stupid. I'm not going to do things I shouldn't do. But do you realize my protection of my family is not actually in my hands? You realize that at some point. You realize that at some point. You realize that breath is not in your hand. When you lay a baby down in a bed and you have no idea, you don't know if that baby will still be breathing in the morning, you have to lay that baby down and trust him. Every time you get into a car, you're so familiar with it, but statistically, it's very dangerous. But you get into that car, and you trust the one who knows and sees and is able to protect. Every time you put a bite of food in your mouth, you're trusting that you're not going to choke to death on it. Right? Like we, we've got to trust the Lord. We can't freak out just because the world is saying to freak out. They don't know who to trust. They don't have this. Can't freak out. We've got to trust the one who's in control. Can I challenge you today? Obey the Lord's leading. Has he told you to do something? Maybe it was 10 years ago. Maybe it was 10 minutes ago. I don't know. I want to encourage you, go do it. What's the Lord told you to do? Go do it. Be obedient to that thing. Trust him and go do what he's told you to do, whatever that is. Then I want to also ask you this morning, if you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ, I want to ask you, are you willing to do what God tells you to do right now? Because listen, he is calling you to repentance and he's calling you to repentance because he wants to save you he wants to protect you from what is coming. He has always loved you. Yes, he knows you. Yes, he knows your story. Yes, he knows your background. And no, you haven't gone too far that you cannot turn to him now. But the Bible says you must obey. You must be willing. You must come to him. The Bible says confessing your sin. It's what I've had to do. It's what every person who comes to God has had to do. You cannot buy, can't buy heaven like an insurance policy. You can't just sign up for it because it would be nice in case it's true. You've got to realize you're a sinner, and your sin has separated you from a holy God, and unless that sin is removed, you're going to be separated from a holy God forever in a place that Jesus talked more about than he talked about any other single topic. You're going to be separated from God in hell forever if you do not turn to the Lord. You say, well, that's not fair. He made a way. He came and he died. What more could he do? He made a way. Well, I don't like a God that would send people to hell. God doesn't send people to hell. People send themselves to hell. God made a way for them to escape. And if you refuse it and you give God the middle finger your entire life, who do you have to blame when you stand before God? I don't know who God's speaking to, but he is speaking to somebody, and I would beg you, turn this morning to him. It doesn't add anything to me. It's all about you being saved. Let's pray together. Lord, thank you so much. 
mercy, your kindness, your love for us sent you here. Put yourself on a cross for us, taking our sin upon yourself, being separated from your Father so that we would never be separated from you. Lord, I pray for any person who can hear my voice this morning who does not know you. I pray that they would turn to you now. And if that's you, if you can hear the Lord, maybe it's the first time ever, but you can hear the Lord this morning telling you to turn, inviting you to come to Him. He's searching your heart and searching your mind and showing you that you are not saved and He loves you and He wants you to turn to Him this morning. Are you willing to obey God? Or are you willing to say, no, I refuse? The Bible says that if we will not acknowledge Him before people, then He will not acknowledge us before His Father in heaven. But if we will acknowledge Him before people, then He will acknowledge us before His Father in heaven. So this morning, if you want to receive Jesus Christ, the Bible says you must confess, you must admit that you are a sinner. It comes by humbling yourself first and foremost and admitting that you are a sinner. And so tell Jesus that, Jesus, I have never talked to you until now, but I admit that I am a sinner. I see it. And I hear you calling me. So I ask for your forgiveness. I know I've sinned against you. I ask for your forgiveness. And I ask for you to save me. Do that now. Ask him, Lord, please save me. Come into my life. Be my Lord, Savior, King. I give myself to you now. Just do that. Give, give myself to you now because you gave up your life for me. Thank you for helping me to hear you today. It's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. Hey, if you prayed that prayer this morning, I want you to understand, based on the word of God, that all of heaven is rejoicing over one sinner who repents. And so heaven is rejoicing. I would love to rejoice with you. If you prayed that prayer this morning, if you're not watching online, please send me an email, clindsay at theriverchurch.cc. Send me your phone number so that I can call you and we can pray together. If you're here in person, I'd love to talk to you for a moment. Just wait around a couple moments. We can, we can talk. We can pray. I'll give you a Bible if you need one. Can we stand together, church? Let's sing to the Lord and His goodness.